June 28, 2001, Gordon and Eileen are on board a beautiful cruise liner on a Mexican tour with their best friends. They're celebrating Gordon's recent $2 million lottery win. Gordon bought his lucky ticket at a gas station. Now he and his wife can enjoy a new world of leisure. And after 23 years of farming, these high school sweethearts are ready for some relaxation. The cruise has been unlike anything they've ever done before. Different, but wonderful, so far. As if winning two million wasn't lucky enough, tonight, Gordon is on a lucky streak in the ship's casino, and he's riding high. Gordon intends to gamble while his luck holds, even if that means going all night long. Gordon's a fortunate man, in business, in love, and in life, but tonight, Gordon's luck is about to run out. As his wife once confided in him, every lucky streak takes a vicious turn at some point. When a millionaire goes missing, money is the logical motive. But the twists and turns in this disappearance throw motive and logic overboard. Three American Midwest couples, all the closest of friends, fly to Los Angeles to board a cruise ship in celebration of some amazing good luck. Their luxury suites cost them $20,000 each, but the recent lottery winners, Gordon and Eileen, are footing the bill for all of them. After working hard and successfully raising two children with his wife Eileen, on an impulse buy at the gas station, Gordon buys a lottery ticket and wins $2 million. Gordon and his wife, Eileen, intend to take it easy from now on. They'll enjoy life in the company of their good friends and fully delight in and spoil their very first grandson. It's the happiest of times, or at least it should be. Gordon likes to work with his hands preferring life outdoors on the farm over being cooped up inside. I can't remember a time I didn't see him in his dirty overalls with mud up to his elbows. Even at the end of a long day where, you know, sharing a beer together, guy's completely filthy, working his butt off, covered in sweat. It's not the type of guy you sort of picture, you know, playing shuffleboard, having a martini, doing that kind of stuff. A country man at heart, Gordon isn't the most natural fit as a passenger on a luxury cruise. Gordon has simple tastes. He and his friends are regular churchgoers, like to play bridge and go camping and fishing together. The cruise is a radical leap in their fun-loving exploits as couples. The friends have to talk Gordon into the concept of a cruise. It's not an activity that's ever been on his bucket list. Some people believe that if something really good happens to you, something equally bad is going to happen to you to balance out the nature of things. Quite often we'll get a sixth sense or intuition that will warn us when there's something wrong. Sadly, a lot of us just disregard this and we ignore it, and usually at our own peril. July 7th, 2001. After a week of living a jet-set lifestyle on a luxury cruise ship, Gordon is far from the simple countryman that he was. Gordon is flying high tonight on a winning streak at the ship's casino and highly overexcited. Gordon can't seem to lose. He wins $4,000 while playing poker, all the while sipping whiskey with water. His friends have to drag him away to eat.
After a big meal with lots of drinks, everyone decides to head back to their respective cabins for bed. The next morning, they're booked on an early tour of Cabo San Lucas, and they want to be fresh and rested to enjoy the experience. But sleeping is the last thing Gordon wants to do. He's certain Lady Luck is waiting for him back at the casino. As he tells his friends, he intends to beat the house. Gordon doesn't need the money, far from it, but he's caught up in the thrill. Amazingly, Gordon is right. His lucky streak is waiting for him. He keeps playing, and in this second round, Gordon wins over $10,000. Alone in the casino, as night turns into the wee hours, Gordon sees no reason to stop before his luck does. Big wins at the casino can result in big displays of excitement. You never know who's watching you. Your friends may have left you at the table. You just don't know who's paying attention to you and your new wad of cash. Gordon wakes Eileen at 3.30 a.m., pounding on the door, wild with excitement. He wants to wake all their friends up to tell them about the cash he's won and to celebrate. Gordon is so wired that he has beat the house, Eileen has to talk him down and remind him they are going on a 7 a.m. tour in just a few short hours. And finally, Gordon seems to see reason and dozes off. Not long afterwards, Eileen is again awakened by Gordon, who is walking around their cabin. Eileen is struck with this idea that something bad is going to happen. She jolted out of her sleep at 3.35 a.m., catches her husband out of bed, and is worried that he's about to go out and gamble again. He assures her that he's just going to the washroom, everything's okay, so she falls back asleep. At 4.15 a.m., Eileen awakes, startled, to find her husband, Gordon, is now gone. The second time Eileen wakes up with this bad feeling, this time her husband's nowhere to be found. So it seems like all these horrible premonitions she's been having may actually be leading to something. Eileen gets dressed and heads off to the casino to haul Gordon back. She knows her husband and how much he wants to keep gambling, but there are limits. Their special trip to Cabo San Lucas is not going to be jeopardized. She figures he was on a high from winning at the casino and being the way he was, probably just kept gambling all night. When they all started calling each other to make plans for that day, they realized that Gordon wasn't with any of them. So they got together and figured what well, they'd find him pretty quickly. He was probably just sleeping on a lounger somewhere. As they search the ship, finding no Gordon, Eileen becomes increasingly agitated. Eileen knows full well how Gordon is flaunting money on board. She's also uneasy about the fact that they're recent millionaires. She worries a worst case scenario has happened, possibly a robbery. She's filled with dread. The friends comfort Eileen. The ship is massive and they've just begun to look for him. They're sure Gordon is somewhere having coffee and watching the sunrise. That's just the kind of thing that Gordon they know would do. Gordon's missing. She has no idea where he is. This leads her back to those dark thoughts she's been having all along. Where is he? Has her premonition come true? Recent lottery millionaires Gordon and his wife Eileen are on a once-in-a-lifetime luxury cruise and have treated four of their very best friends to tickets. Gordon's a man who has had all kinds of extraordinary luck in his life, and now he's on a winning streak in the ship's casino. Somewhere in those early hours of the morning, Gordon gets swallowed up by darkness, and come dawn, his friends must work together to find him and bring him back to their protective fold. By 8 a.m., Gordon's friends can't find Gordon anywhere. They hurry to the purser's desk to report Gordon as missing. An official search of the ship swiftly begins. The friends are told it will take approximately one hour for the entire ship to be searched. But one person in their party is not about to wait the full hour. Gordon's friend Linda goes directly to the captain on the captain's own turf. 
While security searches crew areas and passenger cabins, Linda speaks with the captain privately, a conversation she does not want Eileen to hear. Linda instinctively believes Gordon has fallen overboard. The ship's captain reaches the same conclusion. Gordon is most probably in the water. Linda knows they have to act fast if they're gonna find Gordon alive. So Linda is a former member of the military, so she's quite credible when it comes to her belief that the only plausible explanation is that he's gone overboard. When she comes to the captain to say, this is what we need to do and why, there's a certain sense of urgency because the captain understands that she knows what she's talking about. Linda and the captain pour over a shipping chart to mark the ship's overnight course. Linda asks the captain to plot out the positions of where they were sailing between 3.30 a.m. and 4.30 a.m. when, judging by what Eileen has said, Gordon must have gone missing. Then, Linda gets another idea. She knows money is no object to Eileen. She instructs the captain to get on the ship's radio and broadcast a $50,000 reward for any passenger who locates Gordon. Linda also asks the first officer to report a man overboard. Linda's looking for two pieces of information based on the ship's course. What time did he go overboard and where was the ship at that point? They're trying to plot this on a map so that they can determine where he may be at this point. Eileen remembers opening the door for Gordon at 3.30 a.m. as he's forgotten his key card. Gordon's wired. Eileen persuades him to calm down, and she believes he has. The last time she sees him, he says he's only going to the washroom. The next time Eileen wakens that morning, it's about 4.15, and Gordon's not there. This is where the key to the vanishing hinges. When Eileen finds Gordon missing from the room, her first instinct is to check the balcony Gordon's a chain smoker, and he loves to smoke outside, watching the water. But Eileen immediately sees that it's raining out. After 23 years as man and wife, Eileen knows her husband's likes and dislikes intimately, and she's certain Gordon would never go out on the balcony in the rain. It's at this point that Eileen leaves the cabin to look for Gordon, assuming he must still be gambling. As Eileen heads to the casino, she runs into a staff member vacuuming the hallway, and Eileen tells her she's off to retrieve her husband from the casino. But Eileen is told the casino closed at 3.30 a.m. On her way back to the cabin, she asks another staff member the time. She's told it's 4.30 a.m. Eileen assumes Gordon is bragging about his winnings in one of their friend's cabins. Not knowing which couple he chose, she decides not to wake everyone with phone calls. She'll go back to sleep and wait for a decent hour to find out who her husband bothered with his big casino winnings. Because of her bad feelings, Eileen starts looking for her husband right away. The second she wakes up at 4.15 a.m., she goes looking for him. She doesn't notice anything on the balcony. There's no clues as to his whereabouts. But her looking for him when she did put a real time stamp on his disappearance. The crew are trained to conduct searches when somebody is reported to be missing. They have very specific procedures that they have to follow. In this particular case, they mustered enough crew to conduct a search, and the search proved to be negative for Gordon. Eileen understands Gordon's personality and how he might be an easy target for somebody looking to perhaps abduct him for money. He was flashing his winnings. He was obvious to anybody watching the casino that he had won a substantial amount. While plotting Gordon's possible location, Linda and the captain disagree about whether or not Gordon could have survived the fall from the ship. At 23 knots, having fallen from more than 60 feet, Gordon hits the water at more than 50 miles per hour. The captain says that Gordon would definitely not survive the impact. Linda counters and says Gordon is alive. She remembers jumping off bridges that high as a girl. If Linda can survive a fall like that, a grown man would be even more resilient. At odds with Linda about whether Gordon is alive or not, 
it seems unclear if the captain is considering this rescue mission or not. So what I hear is that Gord went overboard and that's uh, it's an awful thing. I mean, who could survive a fall like that, honestly? Fit as can be as a farmer, worked hard his whole life, but it's a long way down, it's a lot of water. His wife has another theory about Gordon's disappearance. Eileen tells the captain she fears Gordon is being held captive and a regular search of the ship will not be enough. But the captain sees Eileen as a woman in shock, resisting the truth. She reluctantly informs Eileen that there is little doubt Gordon fell overboard. Linda makes a decisive move. She orders the captain to make arrangements for her to hire a helicopter and pilot and have them waiting at the local airport. Linda will show him how a proper sea search and rescue is done. Thankfully for Gordon, he has this friend, Linda, who's ex-military, a former helicopter pilot. She's done search and rescues before. She really knows her stuff. So you couldn't have a better friend in this case. She's Eileen's last hope to find her husband, and she's determined that if the body is in the water, they will find it. Comforted that Linda is taking charge of a potential sea rescue, Eileen is still convinced Gordon is somewhere on board. A helicopter and pilot are found. Linda and her husband Bruce, also former military, and their friend Glenn rush to get to the airport and commence the rescue mission, leaving Eileen and Gina behind. Morning traffic is thick and the friends are tense with anticipation. Linda takes the time to orient her friends to a search and rescue mission on the sea. She instructs them to scan small areas and always stick to your sight quadrant. The friends make efficient use of their time with pre-planning, but still they are making slow progress getting to the airport. Meanwhile, Eileen remains on the ship under observation as the stress of losing her husband at sea takes its toll on her. But all that quickly changes when she sees the proper authorities from onshore have arrived. Eileen explains the obvious scenario that no one on board is fully grasping. Gordon's a millionaire who's been playing fast and loose with money and maybe has attracted the attention of thieves. Eileen isn't necessarily convinced that her husband went overboard. He's a high roller, flush with new money. He's been winning big in the casino. He's got this big bucket of poker chips that's missing. So she thinks that someone could be holding him. She thinks that he could be kidnapped and still be in one of the rooms. Eileen presses the authorities to search the ship properly, as if Gordon is being held and hidden in a hostage for ransom situation. Recent lottery millionaire Gordon is on the cruise of a lifetime with his wife and four best friends. He's also on a serious winning streak in the cruise ship casino. A simple countryman at heart, tonight everyone on board sees a man who looks like he belongs to the jet set. And in his excitement, Gordon is not being discreet about his cash. Somehow, in the wee hours of the morning, Gordon vanishes into the black of the night. And everyone is asking, is Gordon on board or is Gordon overboard? As an investigator, we understand that Eileen knew her husband probably better than anyone. She knows what his personality is like, and she can see him being an easy target for somebody who may be looking to commit a crime. Whether or not her theory about his being abducted is valid depends on many other factors. Right now, her theory is strictly speculation. After enduring traffic, Gordon's rescue party makes it to the Cabo San Lucas airport and rush to the waiting helicopter. The chopper lifts off at 11.30 a.m. Gordon has likely been in the water for eight hours. It's unknown how cold the water is, but being in the water that long would definitely have negative effects on the human body. Now the sea is relatively clear, so flying the helicopter relatively low affords them the ability to see, you know, somewhat under the surface of the water and not just something floating on top. 
they see all kinds of debris, like deck chairs and styrofoam and bits of garbage, but they don't see Gordon. Eileen and Gina spend the morning talking to the Cabo San Lucas authorities and the captain. Eileen believes Gordon is somewhere on board, but the captain too has made up her mind. Gordon went over the railing on his room's balcony, but the captain, by referring to their balcony, reminds the overwrought wife of a very important detail, key in fact. Eileen remembers how it was raining on the balcony at about 4.15 a.m., which proves to her that Gordon would not have been on their balcony. The captain has this theory that Gordon went over his balcony for whatever reason, whether it was a rogue wave or something else that might have happened, maybe he slipped and fell. But Eileen knows her husband better than anyone else. She's been living with him for 23 years. When she woke up, she saw that it was raining and she's convinced that her husband would not have gone out on the balcony if it was raining. He wouldn't even do farm work if it was just drizzling a little bit. Rain is a real factor in why she thinks that he's probably been kidnapped. Eileen tells the police and the captain that she knows beyond a doubt going out in the rain is not something her husband would do. From his many years of farming, she's seen how Gordon, almost irrationally, hates to tend to his land, even in a light drizzle. But the captain informs Eileen that it was not raining outside. Eileen learns it wasn't rain she saw, but water from the window washer working several decks above. Linda on the helicopter radios in for help. They see no one else hunting for Gordon on the water. She knows there should be search boats and aircraft scouring the ocean. Shockingly, Linda also adds, she sees the Coast Guard boat stationed in the water. The cruise ship reports a man overboard hoping this will mobilize the search and reissues the call for a $50,000 reward. So even though the Coast Guard's response has been really slow, we still have Linda. We still have Linda out there in her helicopter searching for Gordon. So right now, she's Eileen's best hope of finding her husband alive. The captain breaks the hard truth to Eileen. It is cruise line policy that the ship cannot wait past its scheduled departure time. They must leave Cabo San Lucas that afternoon. The women are given the choice to continue on board and follow the ship's set itinerary or disembark immediately. They have only one hour to make this monumental decision. Eileen begs the captain to postpone the ship's travel route until Gordon has been found. But the women are told that, unfortunately, there's no alternative. The ship will depart. They must choose if they stay or go. The ultimatum mobilizes Eileen. She pushes her theory about Gordon being held somewhere on board. She has noticed one particular couple watching Gordon on several occasions. If they won't search the ship again, she pleads with the men to at least interrogate this particular couple. Eileen has seen their room, and it's very near hers. One more search in this location could mean Gordon's life will be saved. Meanwhile, after three hours of fruitless searching, Linda's rescue mission is running out of time. The odds are not stacking in Gordon's favor, but the friends are unwilling to give up. They unanimously vote to go refuel and keep looking for Gordon. These are Gordon's friends, and they're not going to give up easily. They search for over an hour, flying in the area, ultimately not finding Gordon. The more time that passes, the more unlikely it is that they'll find him alive. The police officer informs Eileen that they have no probable cause to search the ship again. He gently suggests Eileen must begin to accept that her husband is dead. Their deadline impending, Gina strongly encourages Eileen to pack and disembark. Gina tells her friend gently that Gordon may be gone. 
with Eileen in such bad shape, Gina especially doesn't want to be separated from their friends. Then, what appears to be an anxiety attack suddenly escalates. Eileen flees her cabin and her friend Gina pursues. Eileen bursts into the cabin of the couple she has noticed that appear to be watching Gordon. Eileen demands the shocked couple release her husband. She offers them all of their lottery millions to buy his safe return. Seeing that her friend is in the grip of a mania, Gina runs to the captain for help. Eileen at this time is kind of getting a bit erratic because she's so worried about her husband and she's so convinced he's on board and no one seems to be listening to her. She remembers this couple that seemed to be watching them during the cruise and she goes so far as to burst into their room and demand that they return her husband. They have no idea what she's talking about. They're just people that happen to be in the same place as Eileen and her husband were. So for them, this was pretty startling. The ship's doctor arrives to assist Eileen providing her with a mild sedative. Eileen is quickly removed from the premises and taken to the ship's hospital. The suspects who Eileen has fixated on appear to be nothing more than innocent holidayers. Just minutes before the ship leaves to continue on its course, Gina and Eileen disembark. Separated from the crews and from their friends, the police help them make their way out to the nearest hotel and offer support. They connect them with the rescue mission still at sea and the ship, which still may produce answers. Dusk is falling on the resort city of Cabo San Lucas. Known for its nightlife and water-based activities, it's also very possibly the scene of a life and death struggle. If Gordon went overboard and is still going to be found alive in the water, it is these minutes before the sun is lost entirely that are pivotal. And when they lose the light, the friends turn to their only consolation. Eileen and Gina pray for Gordon's safe return. But as night falls, Linda, Bruce, and Glenn must terminate the aerial search for Gordon. Their hopes of finding him alive in the water are extinguished as the rescue party returns to shore. It's then that the captain gets a message over the radio, which is relayed to police. It's ominous news. Earlier that day, a body is found washed up on a deserted beach, very near to where the friends are searching. But as of yet, there is no further information or identification. It's not even known if the body is a man's or woman's. Recent lottery millionaire Gordon is on a celebration cruise and he's over the top in the ship's casino. It's no secret to anyone in the room that Gordon is hauling in big cash winnings. When he shuts down the casino that night, he leaves all by himself. In the wee hours of the morning, his wife finds her husband has vanished. His friends conduct what looks to be the only sea rescue mission, but find no trace of Gordon. A body washes up on shore on a small secluded Mexican beach, but with no positive identification, the friends refuse to give up hope. Hope that Gordon is still alive somewhere. The body is sent to Mexican authorities for autopsy. The friends have no choice but to wait for information. Even with all the surveillance equipment and potential witnesses on the ship, they're unable to trace Gordon's footsteps essentially through the night, and they're not able to determine where he's gone. At this point, it's a mystery to them. Reunited once again, the friends pray together as they have done for years every Sunday back home in Cedar Falls. Eileen has calmed now, but she still refuses to entertain the idea of Gordon going overboard. She stubbornly continues to insist he's on the ship. Eileen addresses what they are all wondering. There's no way Gordon would commit suicide. 
He has never been depressed and would never willingly be separated from his family and best friends. While the friends await news of the autopsy, they decide, in absence of any police investigation, to see if they can unearth any clues for themselves. Eileen is asked to examine what's there and also take special note of things that may be missing as well. They begin a close inspection of Gordon's belongings. She believes all of Gordon's clothes are accounted for. Then the roll of cash that Gordon won at poker is discovered crammed into the toe of his sneakers. Gordon's disappearance does not appear to be related to his big win in the casino. Eileen still sees this as a sign that holds some kind of hope. Gordon would never have hidden the money if he hadn't had a reason to fear robbery. Then Eileen finds Gordon's cigarettes. Gordon is a dyed-in-the-wool chain smoker and his wife knows Gordon would never be willingly separated from his cigarettes. Eileen knows Gordon better than anyone and what his habits might be. For her to find his pack of cigarettes, that's unusual to her because he would always have those with him. Although Eileen doesn't believe her husband went out to the balcony, is a fall the most plausible explanation? Then, Eileen remembers something important. The morning of the vanishing, Gordon has cash, but he has a plastic bucket of poker chips as well. There seems to be one thing missing from their possession, the poker chips. Gina thinks back to when she hurriedly had to pack up their possessions. She can't recall seeing the poker chips anywhere, though she admits she was in such a rush she could have missed it. But there is one place they both do remember seeing a plastic bucket brimming with chips. This could easily be a coincidence, or it could mean everything. It's easy to get complacent on a cruise ship. You feel like everyone's there having a good time. Nothing bad could possibly happen. But these are basically floating cities. There's no background checks done before someone gets on. You really don't know who you're dealing with. So who knows who Gordon might have ended up with, who he might have met, who might have had designs on his money, but we'll never know. The friends are divided. Linda, Bruce, and Glenn are convinced that the autopsy will soon reveal Gordon is dead. They fear Eileen is becoming desperate and irrational. But Gina gambled with Gordon that night and remembers his bucket of poker chips. She and Eileen both saw the poker chips in the couple's stateroom. Eileen contacts the police. This time, she has something concrete for them to investigate a robbery. At the next port of call, the couple are picked up by police as persons of interest for questioning. Their room is thoroughly searched for clues. The couple are interrogated for several hours. They claim the chips legitimately belong to them. They are able to identify the croupier from the ship's casino, who confirms their story. The couple won their money legitimately. They are eventually released, free of any suspicion. With Eileen in a state of poor mental health, the friends decide to leave. There's nothing more to be done in Mexico. They return home to Iowa. Days after they arrive home to Cedar Falls, the results of the autopsy come in. Finally, Eileen will get the support for her theory that there is more to this case than what is on the surface. Gordon, his wife Eileen, and four of their best friends in the world 
are on board a luxury cruise ship. Gordon is a big lottery winner, and after a hot winning streak in the casino, his wealth is even more conspicuous. When Gordon vanishes from the ship, no one knows why, nor are there any clues as to how he disappears. Incredibly, the missing man's friends hire a helicopter and search the seas for him themselves. When a body washes up on a secluded section of Mexican shoreline, everyone awaits news whether the body is Gordon's or not. Linda's search on the helicopter didn't turn up anything, but sometime later, a body does wash up on shore, and everyone is pretty sure it's Gordon. To get the autopsy report back takes a week, which is an extremely long amount of time for a case like this. Well, an autopsy will determine that someone is drowned by the fact that uh, they would find water uh, deep within their lung tissue. The only way that water gets into the lungs is if someone is actually still breathing and breathe water into their system. Weirdly, there were no signs of injury. There were no bruises, no broken bones. The cause of death was drowning. So this raises even more questions about what really happened to Gordon. If Gordon had fallen from his balcony like the captain thought, it would have been like hitting concrete from that height. So we'd expect to see more injuries on the body. This itself raises suspicions. Why were there no signs of any injury on Gordon other than the fact that he was dead from drowning? There's no evidence to point us in any particular direction. So ultimately, this is a complete mystery. Likely he was in the water trying to swim or struggling to stay afloat for a period of time. But with this revelation comes confusing details that are difficult for the family to interpret. All of a sudden, Eileen's theory about her husband being kidnapped seems to bear some weight, especially since he has no injuries on his body. Is this something that really could have happened to him? Now they're taking another look at this. It would indicate to me that he was likely placed in the water carefully or from certainly a, a much lower height if he had to have been pushed off the ship, for example. It's highly unlikely that he would have no marks if he had gone off from the height described. But authorities decide to look no further and appear to consider Gordon's disappearance case close. Eileen is left in a state of great emotional distress and her friends fear for her welfare. Eileen becomes haunted by horrific images, things that possibly could have happened to Gordon in the water. Eileen knows she'll never get over the loss of her loving husband, Gordon. But she also fears she will never recover from the trauma and the way his disappearance is dealt with. The friends are racked with guilt that they persuaded Gordon to take a cruise that was so unsuited to his personality. They all pray that however Gordon got into the sea, he was knocked out and did not suffer. When you have nothing, all you can have is hope. And Eileen has one final idea. Six best friends are on a luxury cruise. In the span of a single evening, they are reduced to five. The family is strongly advised not to see the body. It is degraded too much from its time in the water and in its transport from Mexico to Iowa. The family must take the word of authorities that they are, in fact, burying Gordon. High school sweethearts, and after 23 years of marriage, Eileen does not get to see Gordon one last time to say goodbye. 
Even though the body apparently washes ashore and authorities are saying it's Gordon, Eileen isn't convinced. She wants to see her husband, which I think most wives would want to. You want to be sure. You want to be absolutely sure this is your husband. They won't let her. So to this day, no one from the family has actually identified Gordon. She's had to take the authorities' word for it. Gordon was on a big, big lucky streak in life until all his luck ran out. Will Eileen and her friends ever know what forces were at play to take Gordon away from them? I know it's not gonna happen, but uh, I'm still expecting him just to open up my front gate, bum a smoke and sit down next to me and just lay one up one more time. I can't imagine what his family's going through right now. What, what is his wife supposed to say to his kids for the rest of their lives? That Dad, he was a hard worker and he did everything he could to take care of him and now just, he's gone. Meanwhile, the land Eileen and Gordon planned to retire on, on which they were to build their dream home, goes up for sale. Eileen suffers from depression and PTSD. She's haunted by images of the man who was her best friend struggling in the black ocean before being swallowed up forever. This is an interesting case because we have a situation where a person goes missing, their body is ultimately located, but there's no evidence whatsoever to help determine how they came to be in that particular situation. How did they get off the ship? Were they pushed, did they fall? The idea of a window washer scaring Gordon to the point where he slipped and fell off his balcony, it's, it's possible, highly unlikely. Uh, the odds that a window washer wouldn't have seen this occur and report it is also very unlikely. So you now have to bring in this extra person who would have to willfully disregard the fact that Gordon has gone off the ship. So anything's possible, this is highly unlikely. There were some nights we'd uh, watch the sun go down and have a few puffs and just relax. It's not the same. That, uh, yeah, there ain't nobody in that chair next to me, you know what I mean? It's, uh, it's rough. Even though the story ended in tragedy and the family will never have answers about what happened to Gordon, the one bit of hope Eileen can take away is that he had such great friends like Linda who rallied around and did everything they could to find him. Eileen is separated from her soulmate, left alone to ponder the lucky ticket that Gordon bought at a gas station and how her prophecy of disaster came true.